Puerto Rico, oftentimes referred to as an unincorporated territory, which my friends have suggested don't use that terminology, and I agree, an unincorporated territory of the United States, which I, however, and they politically and legally define as a colony of the United States, has 3.5 million United States citizen residents who do not have the right to vote for president or representation in Congress, and it is making headlines these days because of its inability to pay a $72 billion debt owed to holders of its devalued bonds. Well, there have been comparisons between Greece and Puerto Rico. The reality is that they are totally distinct situations. Greece has sovereignty. Puerto Rico does not. Puerto Rico is unable to declare bankruptcy, cannot devalue its currency, cannot go to international financial institutions under the present colonial system. In fact, one of the solutions offered in the United States to solve the chaotic economic crisis is to place the entire island in receivership. In other words, to go back to an even more rigid colonial system so that the bonds market can protect its investment now. Washington helped create Puerto Rico's staggering debt crisis and its effect on millions of what are effectively second-class U.S. citizens and what is to be done. First, we'll speak with David Galarza, co-founder of Siempre Este, directly from the meeting he has co-convened over mobilizing support for the Puerto Rican people in response to the looming economic crisis. And then we'll be joined by Michael Kink with Strong Economy for All and a hedge clipper. You'll just have to wait and find out what that is. David, thank you for taking some time from the meeting to educate, educate, educate. Thank you, Mimi, and thank you, Ken, for having me on and, and, and for sharing the information you just shared about what's going on in Puerto Rico. Well, let's uh, indeed begin with, is it fair for me to suggest that both uh, the colonial status of Puerto Rico has everything to do with the debt and Washington and our institutional monetary system, really, our banksters, etc., are responsible for what is happening in Puerto Rico? It's not a stretch at all. It's, it's very accurate. It's on point. This isn't something that was manufactured, but it's something that didn't come to pass, you know, within the last, you know, six months, uh, even six years. We all know that Puerto Rico is, is a colony. You know, they try to call it different things, uh, Estado Libre Asociado, uh, Free Associated Republic. Uh, they think that the Commonwealth, uh, you know, they try to package it in different terminology. It is, by all intents and purposes, a colony. Um, people in Puerto Rico, the 3.5 million you mentioned, have a voice but no vote in Washington, and they're governed mostly uh, overall by the laws governing the U.S. Anything that passes in Puerto Rico, even in the courts, can be superseded by federal courts. And right now we have um, we had we had a rally today at on Park Avenue at, at 399 Park Avenue, which is the tower that Citigroup occupies, because uh, they invited um, some 200 or so hedge fund managers, uh, bond bond uh, investors, and, and other folks that, that were involved in this scheme uh, in Puerto Rico to meet with a former IMF official by the name of Ann Kruger and representatives of the government in Puerto Rico. And the focus was to, I guess, demystify or, or, or brief uh, the folks there on her austerity plan for Puerto Rico. This is uh, also an IMF official that was directly tied to the austerity plans that went down in Greece, just to give you a little primer or a little background as to you know who the folks are that we're dealing with. There have been calls for an audit of the debt, how the debt arose, what are the machinations of the hedge funds and the banks and the creation of the debt and of the U.S. government. What do you think about that? What also needs to be done? David? Well, we seem to have uh, dropped... David, let's see if we, David, let's see if we can get David. Yep, we have. 
So we are missing a call. We are going to listen to a little bit more of Ruben Blades and get David Galarza back on the line. Ruben Blades paved the road for us to get David Galarza back on the line. Did you actually uh, get Ken's question before we lost you? Something about, some, yeah, something about uh, there have been calls for an audit of this debt. Yeah, to see how, to see how it evolves and who to blame. Yeah, I mean, that's all fine and good, but the, 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 well, the central point is right now that According to Ann Kruger, at least in her report, and the people that are promoting it or pushing it, they're making they're making the the the, the people that are most affected by these by these austerity measures to be the ones who pay this debt, you know, in essence, by by cutting essential programs and services, by privatizing private agencies, by eliminating the minimum wage, by getting rid of uh, overtime, and um, bringing back essentially uh, child labor in many instances. There's already, the, the 3.5 million people in Puerto Rico are already subjected to the highest in, uh, sales tax in the nation, 11.5%. The unemployment rate is through the roof. There's an exodus of families like no other time in the history of Puerto Rico. There have been, ex you know, there have been migrations in the past to an Operation Bootstrap, another failed economic program uh, started by the U.S. back in the 40s and 50s. But right now we have uh, at least a thousand families leaving every month to, 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 to um, and, and some of the best and brightest minds from the University of Puerto Rico are also leaving in droves, many to Florida and the Southwest and then some to New York, but mostly to, to Florida. So, you know, the root of the problem, like the like had suggested or said outright, is colonialism. It's the laws that have been in place that have strangled the, the, the economy in Puerto Rico. It's the big box stores like the Walmarts and the Walgreens and the CVSs that are all over Puerto Rico. There's more Walmarts and those chain stores per capita in Puerto Rico than any place else. You go around the island right now, these towns are ghost towns. Because what's supposed to be the engine, the economic you know, engine for any town, any country, any municipality, should be the small mom and pops. They're virtually non-existent right now because of onerous laws, because of the bureaucracy in the, in the, in the local government, and because, you know, the, the competition is impossible with the Walmarts and the CBSs and all these other franchises that are all over the islands. You know, one of the things you mentioned and I heard, and I can't let it go by without further comment, child labor, wait a minute, they're re-legitimizing yeah, child labor, eliminating the, the minimum wage, and I know there's another issue about Medicaid. So talk about those things because that is staggering and really points to what the people of Puerto Rico are going through. Well, well, Puerto Rico has always been sort of like the showcase or the, the, the laboratory for the U.S., whether it was operating on our women, uh, which was why Puerto Rican women have some of the highest rates of sterility uh, in the Caribbean, if not the world. Um, it, it was about the, the dropping bombs on Vieques for some 70 years um, to test their their, their weapons of mass destruction. It's been about Monsanto setting up shop also in Puerto Rico. So it's always been a lab of sorts, especially for neoliberal policies. It was supposed to be the shining example in the Caribbean as a anti-Cuba uh, sort of model. And we see how, you know, we see how well that's done, actually. And it's ironic how the president has been moved on Puerto Rico, but it has, you know, fallen over backwards on Cuba. It's really an interesting time. And again, the child labor, if you could just address that in the Medicaid issue? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, on the Medicaid issue, the Medicare and Medicaid issue, they are planning to already eliminate some 200 to 300 million dollars of, uh, of essential vital funding. And SEIU and other unions have been pushing back on that because right now, as it stands, um, at, a, at a time, especially when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Obama's plan, here they are 
trying to cut back uh, on giving, providing this kind of care to 3.5 million American citizens, um, which is, uh, you know, which is, which is horrible. And also, on top of that, Kruger is recommending further cuts uh, to, to uh, Medicare and other social service type programs. It's from 60 to 70 people, 70% of the people in Puerto Rico rely on. And in terms of the child labor piece, yeah, they're planning to at least, you know, lower us up the age of certain um, occupations um, that, that uh, where, where young people, your children could go back to work and, and again, probably be working for, for less than minimum wage because they're trying to eliminate that too. Again, at a time when we're pushing for the fight for 15 in New York State and other places, of course, the country, they want to eliminate the minimum wage. But the only thing a lot of the Democrats can figure out to do is to try to get uh, Puerto Rico under the bankruptcy laws, which is now exempt from. Does that really solve any problem, or do we want some judge to decide this, or we want a more political solution? I think we need a more political solution, and, and bankruptcy and bailouts and all that sort of stuff, and restructuring, speaks to a temporary solution, speaks to band-aids on this, on this overarching problem. We need sustainable solutions, and so, and so why, that's why I'm here today with many compañeros and compañeras, some that were with us at the rally, others that came here after work, from all sectors of society, people from the union movement, you know, artists, teachers, students, all kinds of folks that here, teachers, and from the diaspora at least, we're trying to come up with solutions and, 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 and certain projects that we can tackle in the interim and the short term and also, you know, start looking at things that we can do in the long term. Working closely, of course, in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who are most affected because they live on the islands. And um, we have some of the best and brightest minds live in Puerto Rico, but we still have many, many uh, brilliant minds in Puerto Rico right now. If I can, for, for, you know, just to offer an example of one organization that I've worked with closely in defeating the gas pipeline a couple of years ago that they had wanted to build these multinationals in Puerto Rico. Casa Pueblo in the town of Arjuntas is building the country as we speak. They're building the nation. It's not so much about rhetoric, but actually getting getting down and dirty on your, on your hands and knees and literally uh, growing trees, I mean, planting trees and, and, and offering sustainability solutions, um, using solar power to, to power their facilities, bringing in children and young people and, and university students from not only around from Puerto Rico, but around the world to come in and study what they're doing. They have the people's forest. They have outdoor people schools in the forest. They're doing some amazing things. That's just one example. I know there are a lot of young people that are already going back to the land, so to speak, and growing um, vegetables and growing fruit and doing all kinds of stuff in, in, in the campo, in, in, in the countryside or in, in the forest. There are other kinds of folks that are, you know, going back to fishing. Puerto Rico should not be importing any food. We should be self-sustainable that way. Right now, Walmart has a lock on all the food pretty much that's sold in Puerto Rico. We shouldn't be getting fish from Canada. We have, we should have a self-sustainable fishing industry, fishing fleet. We could be a laboratory for such good stuff like solar energy and wind energy. We have the resources to, to do that. There's no political will because people aren't lining their pockets with those, those, those kinds of you know ideas. But it's time to turn the tide, and that's all we're here in, in, in New York, gathering as a diaspora. And we're hoping that this energy is, is contagious and gets more people involved because right now there's more Puerto Ricans living in the States than there are in Puerto Rico. And it's incumbent upon all of us, whether we have family there or not, if we identify ourselves as Puerto Ricans to stand up, stand strong, offer ideas, and work with one another. And I know you have to return to the meeting. I just want to ask you, since it's being pushed mightily now, uh, the New York Times, for example, had an op-ed on Saturday, Statehood for Puerto Rico Now by Pedro Pialuzzi. Your thoughts on that and whether the issue of uh, independence, breaking the bounds of the colonial status are the issue for Puerto Rico in conjunction with really being able to address the debt crisis. You know, the president and, and, and the Congress has already made it clear to anyone who has any illusion or fantasy that Puerto Rico can ever become a state by ignoring us and by basically saying, like, Ford did to the city, drop dead. There is no interest on the part of this president, not just Obama, but even presidents before. There's no interest on the part of these, this ministry, these, these members of 
Congress, a few of them have said a few things, but there's no overwhelming interest on the part of the members of Congress to do anything about Puerto Rico in terms of its status. We should be free eventually, or now actually, as the UN has demanded for so many years, to be a sovereign nation. You know, we've got some nations that are smaller than Puerto Rico. We have nations obviously that are bigger. You know, we can, we can, we can enjoy we can continue to enjoy good relations with the United States, and but we should be able, right now, for instance, there's a, there's a, there's a law, you know, the cabotage law that requires that every ship that comes to Puerto Rico have a U.S. flag and a U.S. crew, and that's driven up the prices. I think I might have mentioned, I just mentioned that a little while ago. That's key to strangling the economy in Puerto Rico. Right now, we've had situations in the past, and I observed one myself when Chavez, President Chavez in Venezuela was alive, when uh, we had uh, a governor from the, the, the other party, uh, the faction from the, from the Populares, the status quo party, uh, she had a reception, and, and, and Chavez was invited as a head of state to her inauguration, and I, with my young eyes and ears, heard him say, I would love to be able to give Puerto Rico discounted oil and energy, and they said no. Mm. We can't form our own trading partners. So it's things like that that have strangled the economy for many years and, and will continue to do so. And so, which is why these, you know, bankruptcy or bailouts or any of that talk is, is just a band aid on the problem. These hedge fund vultures are hell bent on continuing to reap profits from Puerto Rico. Mean, you know, the, you know, when they pass laws like Law 22 that allows hedge fund billionaires to set up shop in Puerto Rico and not pay any money on their capital gains. So it's like for one, one for every one or two billionaires that comes out of the states and lands in Puerto Rico, how many families are being sacrificed and, mm -hmm. and are being told you can't put in your own homeland anymore? Well, Jose Alfaro threatened me, least I keep you out of the meeting that you're a strategic <laughs> part of too longer, <laughs> which is taking I place saw him, I saw him, yeah. <laughs> at, at well, 1199. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Ken. This is an issue, obviously, that is not going to be resolved tonight as much as we all love it for, for it to be. Um, but, you know, we hope to be back, either myself or other members of this coalition, to continue the dialogue and conversation. And we invite people of, you know, goodwill um, to join us in this struggle, the same way that we supported the people of Greece, the same way we supported the people of Spain, the same way we supported... Um, People fighting for you know for justice, economic justice, social justice throughout the world. Because you know, like we always say in the labor movement, an injury to one is an injury to all. And right now, they're trying to hurt Puerto Rico bad. And we've been speaking with David Galarza from Siempre Este, and we're going to keep people posted because we have to join in the process of the very things that they are now at their meeting organizing to carry us forward to support our sisters and brothers in Puerto Rico. David Galarza. Thank you so much, and tell Jose I let you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have a good night now. Thank you so much. Thank Alambe. Michael Kink, as promised, with Strong Economy for All Coalition, and he's a hedge clipper. And it's good to hear from you again, Michael. How are you? Thanks, Dave. Doing great. How are you? Excellent. Ex hedge clipper? Hey, <laughs> tell us about what a hedge clipper is. Well, um, folks who have been paying attention to New York politics have been seeing the huge and growing influence of a very small number of hedge fund billionaires over particularly state government in their alliance with Andrew Cuomo to block initiatives that help working people to make sure that taxes on billionaires are low and to execute a kind of a privatization of education policy in particular, but a number of other things. 
that really doesn't fit with what most people in New York are looking for. These guys have spent millions and millions of dollars on Cuomo, on the Republicans that control the state Senate in Albany, and they've used that influence and leverage to really drive our politics and our policy in ways that benefit billionaires and don't help regular people. And a bunch of us got together. We, we started calling ourselves Hedge Clippers informally. It was really trying to do a project that would combine research and reports, organizing and activism to try to expose some of these things. And we said, oh, what the hell? We're going to call it Hedge Clippers as a, as a public effort. And I think it, you know, it, it does, uh, it does kind of, uh, get across the kind of pitchforks at the gate kind of aspect of some of what's going on here in the city and the state that has the most extreme inequality in the country, the hedge fund billionaires are pretty much exhibit A for how the economy is getting worse, politics is getting corrupted, and inequality is exploding. Well, the hedge fund has not only in heavily invested in Governor Cuomo, but also in Puerto Rico, and that's one of the problems, not the only problem. They've got somewhere between 40 and 50, between 40 and 50 percent of the debt. So the hedge clippers produced a massive study about this involvement of the hedge funds in Puerto Rico, and you're going to tell us about it right now. Absolutely. Uh, it's online for anyone that wants to take a look. It's right on the front page at hedgeclippers.org. Uh, it's called uh, Hedge Fund Vultures in Puerto Rico. Uh, and with the subhead, they want huge profits and they'll push austerity to secure them. Um, we do a report on 13 hedge funds and a number of top billionaire hedge fund managers that have brought up, uh, by some estimates, up to half of the debt, uh, Puerto Rican debt, that is outstanding, and are now working in the courts, in the back rooms, in politics, in Congress, and directly with the Puerto Rican government to push harsh austerity measures on Puerto Rico and on Puerto Ricans. Um, the governor uh, uh, of Puerto Rico has, has made it clear, uh, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, that uh, uh, the, the current magnitude of debt, $72 billion and counting, is not payable. Uh, these guys have bought up the debt in an effort not only to get it paid, to make huge, huge returns. Uh, as an example, Paul Singer, one of the hedge fund managers that's in this game, when he pulled a similar stunt with Argentina, they made... 1,300% on a profit on the deal, not double your money, not triple your money, but 13 times your money. And when we're talking billions, that's an extraordinary return. And the, the basic idea is to demand that wages go down in Puerto Rico, to demand that taxes go up in Puerto Rico, to demand that utility rates and water rates go up, and that all that money be shoveled straight to the hedge fund billionaires to make them richer. Uh, and the rates of return that they're looking for are extraordinary. And there was an event out on uh, Long Island, the East Hamptons, on uh, Saturday, which originally was supposed to focus on Cuomo, but uh, and also some of the Puerto Rican hedge fund activity came up also. So you were out there. What happened? Uh, we had about 250 people uh, from the Hedge Clippers effort. We uh, protested and demonstrated outside a $5,000 a plate fundraiser that the billionaire hedge fund manager Dan Loeb held for our governor, Andrew Cuomo. Um, Loeb is, is one of the, the hedge fund billionaires that has been really active in New York State politics. And his firm at least as of the end of 2014, was heavily invested in Puerto Rican debt. Uh, a number of the other attendees and invitees of this uh, effort uh, for Cuomo were hedge fund billionaires living out there in the Hamptons. So we felt it was important to be there to make a point. And there was a great coalition of folks 
uh, you know, folks that are uh, uh, arguing about Puerto Rican debt, folks that are arguing about the way that New York City tenants got screwed under Cuomo's reauthorization of the rent laws, folks that are fighting for public schools and, and, and for fairness in our inner public education system, folks that are outraged by the influence of big money in politics. So the Puerto Rican debt folks, uh, Make the Road New York, a number of other uh, groups were an important part of the effort. And uh, I will note, you know, just to be fair, that when Juan Gonzalez of the Daily News interviewed, uh, covered our report on Friday, uh, Lowe's people told him that he had recently disinvested from some uh, or all of his Puerto Rican debt. There's really no way to verify that. The records aren't public yet. But our report includes uh, an extensive accounting of Lowe's investments in Puerto Rican debt um, as of the time of the report, and uh, they're uh, they're over uh, uh, they're they're in the, the range of hundreds of millions of dollars. And Michael, what would you say to uh, the activists around uh, Puerto Rico groups like Siempre Este and so on in response to what should be done about this outrageous debt that the hedge fund entrepreneurs, uh, the banksters, if you will, have everything to do with. The hell with it? Well, you know, the, 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 the government of Puerto Rico was encouraged to take on more and more debt by banks, by mutual funds, and partially by hedge funds. When it became clear that much of that debt was not sustainable, a whole other set of vultures came into play. That's where the hedge funds come into the discussion. Uh, they have fought in the courts to block the Puerto Rican uh, utilities from being able to declare bankruptcy. They have lobbied in Congress with huge amounts of money trying to block Puerto Rico from being able to restructure its debts or, uh, or declare bankruptcy. And the fact is that both President Obama and Congress have an important role to play in setting up some sort of negotiations where the people of Puerto Rico and the government of Puerto Rico have a reasonable voice. As it is right now, these banks and hedge funds have the people over a barrel. It's unconstitutional in Puerto Rico to default on the debt. And you could see a scenario where public utilities, public uh, assets like water, even the, 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 the tax receipts of the government could basically be impounded by these hedge fund guys. And uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the American government doesn't take steps to set up a fair process, that seems to be what's going to happen. And so, you know, uh, I think the people in Puerto Rico and allies in the, in, in, uh, in the United States um, are the people that should be driving this train. We're trying at Hedge Clippers to point out the individual people, many of them in New York, many of them connected to New York politics that are playing an important role here. And I think we would be allied with what a number of groups are calling for, for government action on the side of the people uh, rather than on the sides of the banks and the hedge funds. Michael, can you tell us again where we can get the report? Hedgeclippers.org. It's right on the front page. And how can I become a can I become a hedge clipper? I mean, I would like to give a couple of people a, uh, a haircut. <laughs> Absolutely. What a you know, Sign up on our website. Give us your email address. We're on Twitter at Go Hedge Clippers. Uh, we're on Facebook. Relatively easy to find. Just look for the Hedge Clippers. And uh, we will continue to be carrying out actions and organizing. We're going to be doing more research and reporting. Reports. There are currently 17 reports on our site outlining the various ways in which hedge funds and hedge fund billionaires are destroying our economy, corrupting our government, and exploding inequality. Wow, what a, what a note to end on. You said it all. Michael Kink, it's nice to hear from you again. And we have been speaking with uh, brother Michael Kink from A Strong Economy from All Coalition and a Hedge Clipper. And uh, we got to give some people, uh, what is it, 50 cents in a shave? I'm looking at all my brothers who are in the studio now. 50 cents? All right. I'm in the... That was, that was, like, okay. that was like 50 years ago. Okay, it was 50 years ago. Uh, you know, Scott Sommer is waiting to get on with housing. You know, Max Schmid and Ken Nash are all saying, wow, Rosenberg, where have you been? Well, that's another story. Well, Thank I've never you. had a shave. It's for this world. That must be it. <laughs>
Michael K., thanks for joining us. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you Wednesday morning from 6 to 8 a.m. And we're going to do a lot more in Puerto Rico. Have a good evening. Get ready for our housing notebook. I'm Amy Rosenberg. And I'm Ken Nash reminding you to go to our webpage, www.